Hi everybody and welcome back to the Hardcover Podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. So The Outsiders is a book that a lot of people are probably familiar with because it appears on a lot of reading lists for school. And I'm not sure if this is everybody's experience, but I know for me personally, a lot of the books that were on those reading lists, I just never found very interesting, and I didn't enjoy reading a lot of them. So it would be understandable that a lot of people wouldn't want to give The Outsiders a chance because it appears on the same list. However, I find that The Outsiders is actually one of the few books that I had to read for school that I genuinely enjoyed and have read multiple times since then. And so if The Outsiders is on your reading list or if you remember it from school and never really read it or wanted to read it then, then I think that this is definitely a book you should go back to and reread because I definitely think that it's this is one of the few from school that I found worth and that I, I really enjoyed reading. So The Outsiders is a book that actually started as a short story that S.C. Hinton started writing when she was 15. Now, the fact that she wrote a full-length novel at 15 is already impressive by itself, but the fact that it was also good enough to be published and get a lot of recognition, that a lot of people are still talking about it even today, almost 60 years later, is really, really impressive. So The Outsiders, like I said, she started writing it when she was 15. It was published when she was 16 in 1967. And even years later, she was astonished by how popular it had become and how many people were praising it and just how many people enjoyed reading it. There's actually a letter in my copy of the book that she wrote to the reader. This is many years after the book was published. It was a, a reprint of the book. And she basically expresses that exact sentiment, that she just can't believe that the book became so popular, that so many people enjoyed reading it. She started writing the book as an outlet, a creative outlet for difficult things she was dealing with in her life. It was kind of a way of escapism, and that's really why she started writing. And I know a lot of writers do the same thing, so it's really, I think, impressive to see that she was able to take a work that really just started as a creative outlet and was even only meant to be a short story and that it became such this... I mean, a lot of people recognize this title now and a lot of people know this book. And so I think that that's definitely a testament to how something that you think might not turn into anything can become very popular very quickly. And so I think probably through this, she might have realized that just writing what you want to write is sometimes all you need to do. And that's, again, I just, that's part of the reason why I enjoy this book so much, because just thinking about the author's story herself, I just, I am in awe of her all the time when I think about this book. So at its core, The Outsiders is a book about a group of kids who are immersed in greaser and gang culture in Oklahoma. Now, it's never really stated in the book that it takes place in Oklahoma, but it's a pretty well-agreed-upon fact that's where it takes place. And the book basically discusses how being immersed in that culture and being a greaser influences their lives, and as the title suggests, it also explores characters that the author feels are outsiders from this culture and that they don't quite fit in, that there's something about them that sets them apart from everyone else. And so before I really get into it, I want to discuss some of the characters that I'm going to be talking about. These aren't all of the characters, these aren't even necessarily all of the really important characters, but these are the ones that I'm going to be discussing while I'm talking about some of the things that I think are important from this book. So the main character is a kid named Ponyboy. He's supposed to be 14 years old, so he's the youngest out of everyone in this book. And, he, like I said, he's the main character, and the story is told from his perspective. So we see the way that he kind of interprets his life, and the way that he reacts to the difficult things that he deals with. And, again, as the title suggests, he is one of the main outsiders to this culture. And it kind of shows how he perceives things differently from how everyone else around him just talks and interacts with each other. So the second character is Derry. It's Ponyboy's older brother. It's his oldest brother. He has two. And basically he's his caretaker because their parents died in an accident that I'm not sure honestly if it's fully disclosed. I think it was a car crash, but I honestly don't 100% remember. And Derry is very strict on Ponyboy because he feels that Ponyboy can do better than everyone else. 
and he basically wants him to do well in school and to kind of try to get himself out of this environment that Derry really feels that they're stuck in, and he works really hard to protect his two younger brothers. Soda Pop is the middle brother, and him and Pony Boy are really close. Um, Soda Pop definitely gets a lot more slack from Derry, and it's never fully explained why, but it's kind of implied that because he's the middle brother and he's a little bit older, Derry has kind of lost hope for changing him, but he still hopes that Pony Boy can grow up and basically, in his eyes, be more mature and do things differently. And again, there's uh, Soda Pop and Pony Boy have a much closer relationship, and they're much more like friends, whereas Derry and Pony Boy are much more like a father and a son. Um, Johnny is Pony Boy's best friend. Even though Johnny is very fragile and everyone protects him a lot, he's actually two years older than Pony Boy. He's supposed to be 16, and he is, um, he. It's told that he has a very difficult family life. His parents are not around a lot. They drink. They really don't take care of Johnny. So everyone else is kind of taking it upon themselves to take care of Johnny and to be kind of his surrogate parents and his family, which is a lot of what this book discusses is that they're all, they kind of treat each other like family. Now, Dally is another greaser. Like I said, all of these characters are greasers. Um, Dally is seen as kind of like the toughest one. He gets into a lot of trouble. He starts a lot of fights. He's been in and out of jail. He's definitely one of the rougher ones who really buys into this culture, or at least seems to. And he also has a really bad reputation with everyone else. Um, and the, I haven't mentioned this, but the the opposite gang is are the Soches, and he has a very rep bad reputation with them. He's always seen mess messing with people. And again, within the gang, they all feel like family, so they they feel like there's a side to him that other people don't know, but other people do not have a very good impression of him. Cherry is a girl that Pony Boy meets when he at the beginning of the book when he goes to the movies, and she's a soch. She's part of basically they have more money, they see them as much more privileged, which for the most part is very true. It's definitely not a misconception at all. And he Basically, Cherry is used as a way for Pony Boy to realize that there might not be as many differences between the Greasers and the Soches as he thought, and that people might have similarities that he never even thought of before. And so Cherry, while of course she is a character that he interacts with a couple of times, she's more used as a way of introducing the concept that they really aren't as different as they seem to be. And they're not, it's not just like a black and white separation between the two groups. Bob is Cherry's boyfriend and he's really only important for a couple scenes in the book. He is one of the socias that antagonizes um, the greasers a lot. Although again, it's, it's pretty mutual. They both mess with each other a lot, but Bob is definitely one of the ones that's more outspoken and is really rude to Pony Boy and Johnny. And he becomes important later on in the story. I don't want to spoil anything yet, but um, Bob is definitely one of the more important socials. It's actually named in this book. So this, as you can see, while I've been talking about the characters, I put images of the actors who portray them in the movie. The movie is, I actually, well, the movie wasn't my favorite, but I did think that it more or less stuck to the book, and that's probably because S.E. Hinton herself actually worked on the movie, and she actually had a role in the production, and movies that the, the author works on almost always come out better. Not always. There are definitely exceptions. I'm not going to name any right now, but there are definitely ones that just did not turn out well. But the fact that she worked on it with them definitely means that the movie is a more or less good portrayal of the events of the book and the characters. And the movie, again, came out in 1983. And so I just wanted to show you kind of a visual because I feel that the the way that they were portrayed in the movie is fairly close to how they were portrayed in the book. A little fun fact about the movie is that when it was translated into Spanish, as you can see here, the title became Rebeldes, which very directly translates to Rebels. And I think that that kind of frames the 
the book in a different way and the characters because as I said before the outsiders kind of suggest that each of the characters in this book especially the main ones really don't fit into their culture and that they are very different from everyone else around them and that something about them just doesn't allow them to quite just buy in to everything that they're being told but rebels suggests that they are fighting against something that they're actively working against a, a larger just thing, whether it's a culture or whatever, whatever it may be, that they're actively working against something. And so again, this is just the title. It's not very important because the story I assume is the same. I'm not sure. I haven't read the Spanish translated version or watched the movie, but I do think it's interesting that the title frames the characters in a different way. So this is the part of the video where if you have not read this book and don't want to be spoiled, I would probably stop it here and come back later. I do want to know if after you've read this book you agree with some of the things I've said or if you just think that this book is something completely different from what I've discussed. But I do think that if you don't want to be spoiled you should stop the video here and come back later. So the Outsiders, I'm just going to do a very quick summary rundown so that way any of the events I'm talking about for people who either haven't read it and just want to know or for people who haven't read it in a while just so the events that I'm talking about are not super confusing. So the book is structured in an interesting way because the climax that you would think would be the climax of the book or sorry, the event that you think would be the climax of the book really isn't. So basically what ends up happening is that Bob, the social that I mentioned before, and a group of other people end up attacking Johnny and Pony Boy because Bob feels that they were talking to Cherry and is basically being territorial over her. And in this fight, they almost end up drowning Pony Boy, and Johnny ends up stabbing and killing Bob in a very futile attempt to save Ponyboy's life. And when Bob is killed, the other four, I believe it's four Soches, kind of scatter and Johnny is left with the realization that he just killed somebody. Now, to be completely fair, I don't think it was entirely unjustified. They would have killed Pony Boy if Johnny hadn't done something, and these boys are portrayed as being very small and weak and not really having a lot of strength, so there mo probably wasn't much else he could have done. But now a 16-year-old boy is weighted with the fact that he just killed somebody and they decide to run away because they think that they're going to basically be, um, the law is going to come after them and they're going to be in trouble. So the first person they go to for help is Dally because they all know that he has done a lot of things that he's had to run away from. He's gone into hiding several times. So he's the first person they think of, of course. So they go to him and he basically tells them to go hide out in this abandoned church, uh, quite a while, quite a way away. And it hide there for several days, basically let it blow over and that he'll meet them there later. So that's exactly what they end up doing. They go, they hide in the church for days, they get some supplies so they don't starve and they don't lose their minds and go get, just be completely bored. And they're there for quite a while, but that part of the book is not very long. So when I said that a character murders another character, especially when it's a main character, you would think that that would be the climax of the book. But it's actually interesting that it's not because that is actually about halfway into the book. There's still a lot of story to be told after that. Now, what I feel is the actual event that is the climax of the book is when Dally finally comes back uh, to see Pony Boy and to see Johnny and basically tells them that nobody's really after them yet, that they're, they're okay, basically, and that the uh, Cherry and some of the other socias are standing up for the fact that Bob definitely incited the violence himself and basically tells them that it's, it's safe to come back now. They go to lunch and they come back to the church and somehow it's implied that it's because of a cigarette they left in the church. The church is on fire. And in that time, there was a school group that came to visit the church. I've never 100% understood how the school group got there or why they were visiting the church in the first place. But either way, there were a lot of kids in the church. And of course, Johnny and Pony Boy, and I believe Dally as well, rush into the church. I, it might have just been Pony Boy and Johnny now that I think about it. Rush into the church to save the kids. And Johnny is in there far too long because he's trying to save one last kid who is still stuck in there. And so he gets very badly injured. And this is the event that I see 
as the main really pusher of the book. And after this, Johnny is very badly injured. He's in the hospital for the rest of the book until, unfortunately, he dies. And so I think that there are two events that kind of split up this book. So when Johnny kills Bob, they are forced to run away from everything that they know. They're forced to be isolated. And it shows them in a different light because now they are completely separated from this culture that they've been so immersed in. And the second event is when Johnny dies because it reveals how each of these characters, and it goes into depth for some of them, how they just grapple with the concept of death and with the concept that one of their closest friends is gone. And so these are some of the ideas that I'm going to be talking about and that I kind of want to show through some quotes in the book from the characters and show that how they deal with things and how they interact with each other and the ideas that are really shown in this book. So the first idea that I kind of want to explore in this book is the idea that there really might not be as hard of a line between the greasers and the socias as is originally thought and as is originally portrayed in this book. And so the first quote for a little bit of context is when Cherry and uh, Pony Boy are at the movies. Um, they have just met, they're starting to talk a little bit, and this is basically her trying to convince Pony Boy that all of the greasers. I mean, sorry, all of the socias are not as bad as he seems, as he kind of makes them out to be, and trying to basically plead with him that they, I mean, at their core, they're all people, and that there's something similar that ties them together. So. I'll bet you think the socias haven't made. The rich kids, the west side socias. I'll tell you something, pony boy, and it may come as a surprise. We have troubles you've never even heard of. You want to know something? She looked me straight in the eye. Things are rough all over. So, the concept that everyone has troubles is not necessarily revolutionary, and but for some reason, it's this epiphany for Pony Boy that he thinks about throughout the rest of the book. And he kind of starts to compare how how they may be similar and how they may not be as different and as just complete opposites as he may have thought because before he really thought that because these kids had money because these kids don't have to deal with poverty and with not even knowing where your next meal is going to come from that they have everything in life that they must not have any troubles at all which of course the gravity of their their issues are very different but basically, Cherry is trying to explain to him that just because someone has what is perceived as everything does not mean that they don't have struggles. And again, of course, the how, how I mean, not bad, that's, that's a bad word to use here, but the real consequence, the real life consequences of their issues are very different because if the greasers don't, can't get food on the table, they don't have money, that obviously, that's a life or death issue. Whereas what she's talking about are the socias kind of feeling that they're detached from everything and not really feeling like they have emotion and not being invested in anything. And these are just very different struggles. And it's something that Pony Boy never even considered. He never even considered that there are struggles that he may not even think of and that he may never experience. And so it's something that's really interesting that kind of introduces this idea to Pony Boy that they're not so different as he thought. And it lets him kind of be a little bit more sympathetic later on when him when he returns back to the the city and when he starts to interact with the socials a little bit more. So this next concept kind of deals with the idea of if you're tough enough in life and don't let things get to you, that somehow life will be easier for you and you won't get hurt as much. And this quote comes from when Pony Boy and Dally are on their way to visit Johnny after he's been injured. And basically, Dally is starting to feel guilt. And this is what he tells Pony Boy. He's basically, this is why he's feeling guilty. I was crazy, you know that kid? Crazy for wanting Johnny to stay out of trouble, for not wanting him to get hard. If he'd been like me, he'd never have been in this mess. If he'd got smart like me, he'd never had run into that church. That's what you get for helping people. Editorials in the paper are in a lot of trouble. 
You'd better wise up, pony. You get tough like me, and you don't get hurt. You look out for yourself, and nothing can touch you. So, he's kind of referencing here that all of them kind of protected Johnny and let him stay himself and didn't really push him to become tougher, to learn how to fight more, to be more aggressive, because, as I said before, they all protected him because of his family life, and he was just kind of seen as, unfortunately, the weaker part of their gang, and so they were all very... They all kind of felt this very nurturing thing towards him and kind of allowed him to stay the way he was without pushing him to become what they considered to be tougher, stronger, whatever the word you want to use is. And now, of course, when faced with death, a lot of people start to feel this guilt. And for Dali, this guilt comes from the idea that if he had pushed Johnny more, then maybe this would not have happened, which of course is probably not true. If Johnny was the kind of person that would risk his own life to save a kid in a burning building, forcing him to be a little bit more aggressive and outwardly tough is probably not going to change that instinct. But at this point, Dally needs to believe that there is something he could have done so Johnny would not have made that choice and would not have gotten injured and would not be facing death now because this is, they don't quite know what's going to happen to him, but they know that his condition is getting worse, that he is most likely going to die, and it just looks like it's really not looking good, so a lot of them are starting to have to deal with the fact that they may lose Johnny, and especially for Dally, he's trying to think of anything he could have done to change the situation and to make it better for Johnny. Right after Johnny dies, Ponyboy falls into kind of a shock, as a lot of people do when they lose someone that's really close to him. Johnny was really Ponyboy's closest friend, and they spent so much time together, especially right before Johnny died, because they had run away together. So Ponyboy kind of falls into this shock, and he's not able to believe that Johnny is really gone. And I just, I think that this is a really good portrayal of the concept that it's really hard to comprehend that someone who you've spent so much time with and that you love so much is not going to come back. I walked down the hall in a daze. Dally had taken the car and I started that long walk home in a stupor. Johnny was dead, but he wasn't. That still body back in the hospital wasn't Johnny. Johnny was somewhere else, maybe asleep in the lot or playing the pinball machine in the bowling alley or sitting on the back of the steps of the church in Windricksville. I'd go home and walk by the lot and Johnny would be sitting on the curb smoking a cigarette and maybe we'd lie on our backs and watch the stars. He isn't dead, I said to myself. He isn't dead. And this time my dreaming worked. I convinced myself that he wasn't dead. So for a lot of the book, Pony Boy is known as kind of this dreamer. He actually enjoys school. He likes reading and he kind of buys into the novels that he reads. And so for this to be the time that Johnny's able to convince himself, I'm sorry, Pony Boy is able to convince himself that everything is better, that this is the one time that he's actually able to fool himself into believing that what he knows to be reality isn't true. I mean, of course, he knows logically that Johnny is gone, Johnny is dead, that that body in the hospital was him, but he just can't comprehend it. He can't accept the fact that his friend, someone he loved so much and who a lot of them took it upon themselves to protect, is now gone. That there's nothing he can do. And so it's this shock, this initial shock that he just falls into where he needs to find a way to believe that what he knows to be true isn't as awful as he knows it's going to be. And I think that in this, I mean, that quote specifically, one of the reasons why I think that S.C. E. Hinton's writing is just amazing is because she's able to capture these emotions and she's able to really write about how it feels to lose somebody. And I mean, I obviously don't know exactly if she lost somebody close to her or what exactly, what kind of experiences she went through. But if this is just me speaking, like basically reading into her writing maybe a little bit too much that's entirely possible but it, this definitely reads like someone who knows what it is to lose someone and who can understand that sometimes that's just too hard to accept and you need to believe that it's not true 
So this last quote is the letter that Johnny wrote, writes to Pony Boy right before he dies and the nurse gives it to him. And this one is a little bit long, so I'm just going to read it first and then I'll go into parts of it and kind of explain what I feel the meaning is from this. Pony Boy, I asked the nurse to give you this book so you could finish it. The doctor came in a while ago, but I knew anyway. I keep getting tireder and tireder. Listen, I don't mind dying now. It's worth it. It's worth saving those kids. Their lives are worth more than mine. They have more to live for. Some of their parents came by to thank me, and I know it was worth it. Tell Dally it's worth it. I'm just going to miss you guys. I've been thinking about it in that poem, that guy that wrote it. He met your gold when you're a kid, like green. When you're a kid, everything's new. Dawn. It's just when you get used to everything that it's day. Like the way you dig sunsets, pony. That's gold. Keep that way. It's a good way to be. I want you to tell Dally to look at one. He'll probably think you're crazy, but ask for me. I don't think he's ever really seen a sunset. And don't be so bugged over being a greaser. You still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. There's still lots of good in the world. Tell Dally. I don't think he knows. Your buddy, Johnny. So I just want to explain a couple of things before I go into what I really feel Johnny is talking about here. So the book that he mentions is a book that him and Pony Boy started reading. Well, really, Pony Boy read it to Johnny. It's Gone with the Wind. It, he was able to find it in, uh, in the grocery store, basically, is the joke. And it's basically, he, f he wants him to finish it. And it's kind of Pony Boy. It's the last thing that Pony Boy is able to hold on to from Johnny. Now, the poem that he mentions is one that Pony Boy tells him that he remembers from school when they're hiding, and one of those days when they're hiding in the church. And this is one of the points in the book where, especially, like I said, like after Johnny kills Bob, that once they're able to get away from everything else, their perception and the way that they talk about things changes. So Pony Boy is admiring a sunset as it Johnny explains in the letter and this is what he tells Johnny that he's thinking about nature's first green is gold her hardest hue to hold her early leaves a flower but only so an hour then leaf subsides to leaf so eden sank to grief so dawn goes down to day nothing gold can stay so this is a robert frost poem that pony boy remembers from school and at the time, they really can't comprehend what it means. And Pony Boy doesn't even really have an idea. It's just something that he really likes. And around a lot of the other greasers, and especially Dally, Pony Boy wouldn't really openly talk about enjoying sunsets or enjoying poetry or even his interpretation of poetry, because that's just not what they do. They don't talk about that kind of stuff. Again, their out their outward appearance is very tough and they need to be basically unemotional around each other and not talk about things like that but when just when it's just Joni I'm sorry when it's just Pony Boy and Johnny they talk very differently and they're kind of more open about how they're feeling and how they perceive things and so Johnny tells him as he's dying he kind of makes this realization that at least for him staying gold or being gold is being a kid and not having these influences that kind of hardens you to life and not having these things that make you kind of detached from your life. And this kind of ties back to um, what Cherry was talking about before about their issues and how so a lot of the socias just are basically very fake on the outside. There's really not a better way to put it. They have a very outward, their outward appearance is not really who they are and they feel this need to put up a wall. And so this is kind of a way that they're connected and Johnny is basically pleading with Pony Boy to, I mean, in a way, keep his innocence and to keep that idea of just what it is to be a kid and have that imagination and that curiosity. And I mean, we have to remember at this point, Pony Boy is still only 14 years old. He is only in high school because he skipped a grade in school. And he's still very young. This is a 14-year-old boy who just lost his best friend, who saw his best friend kill somebody, who nearly got killed himself. And I'm sure there are many other difficult things he's dealt with that aren't even explained in this book. And Johnny, his dying wish basically for Pony Boy is that he stays the way he is. That he doesn't allow himself to get swept away by greaser culture and that he doesn't allow himself 
to kind of detach from his life and to lose the parts of him that Johnny really feels make him who he is. And so this is why I think that this letter is really important because, I mean, obviously the book ends right after this. We have no idea how Pony Boy really, if or at all, if he changes from his experience with Johnny and from the fact that Johnny's dead. But we can only hope that Johnny's wish for him is does come true and that Pony kind, Pony Boy kind of allows himself to keep this curiosity and I mean a lot of things that would seem very childlike but an environment like this are often the very first things to go. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed my thoughts on this book and maybe agreed with some of them. Again, if you didn't, that's totally okay. There are probably some things that I missed or some things that I misconstrued. But I just hope that you enjoyed my analysis of this book and that for those of you who haven't read it yet and kind of wanted to know more about it, that you do go back and read it. And for those of you who maybe only read it for school and had a bad impression of it, that you might give it a second chance because I'm really glad that this is one of the books that I actually read from school. And I am glad that now I've reread it a couple of times. And for those of you who enjoy movies <laughs> for instead of the book or on top of the book, the movie is probably something that's worth checking out as well. My next video is going to be in two weeks about a book called Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. It's a new release that actually comes out next week on January 12th. And that, that video, like I said, will be coming out in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed and thank you. Thank you for watching.